thing we want to do is we want to check for serious bleeding. Wherever serious bleeding occurs, there is a very simple way of stopping serious bleeding. That is called direct pressure. Your hand, the wound, direct pressure. Better yet, your gloved hand, the wound, direct pressure. Better than that, some kind of bandage and your gloved hand and the wound, applying direct pressure to the wound. Um, we used to have, in the old days, of pressure points and those kind of things. We don't teach that anymore. It's too difficult. People don't remember. And most wounds, almost mo even severe wounds, can be stopped by simply applying enough direct pressure to the wound. Then we want to, if we're going to have to leave that person to go with somebody else, we want to apply a pressure bandage. That bandage is any kind of bandage you can find. If you can't find one, what, should, what would you use if you couldn't find a bandage in your first aid kits? A shirt. Whose shirt? The victim's. The victim's shirt. Right. I already got one shirt. If I start taking my shirt off to make it, then I'm going to be out of shirts. Every victim should have their own piece of clothing that they can use it. Besides, they're already bleeding on themselves. Go ahead and use their, their shirt. Tie it off nice and, and tight to make sure as tight, as, not as tight as you can, but nice and firm to try and hold that pressure on that wound. Now we want to make sure it's tight, but not too tight. So how do we find out if it's too tight? Well, it's called the Blanche test, or, or the 2-4 test. In other words, we grab their finger or the fingernail and pinch it, hold it for two seconds, and in less than four seconds, the blood should return to that, to that extremity. So if, in other words, if I put a bandage on my arm, or your arm, because I'm not going to I can bandage myself, but then I would put, pinch my finger, hold it for two seconds, and it should refill in less than four seconds. If it does, then it's not too tight. How do we know if the if a, uh, if a uh, bandage is doing its job, well, the bleeding will stop or radically diminish. So after we've taken care of that, then we want to treat the patients for shock. There are lots of indications for shock, usually dizziness, nausea, vomiting, pale pallor, people you know, like the blood's draining from their face. Any of those are indications of shock. You don't actually have to be injured to be in shock. You can just witness something horrible and be in shock, or just the traumatic events around you can put you into shock. There's lots of indications. The best news is, the good, I should say the good news is, it's very easy to treat for shock. We simply maintain the person's body temperature and elevate their feet 6 to 12 inches. Now when I say maintain, well, the first thing people want to do is wrap somebody up. Well, that's okay if it's cool. If it's 110 degrees outside, we certainly wouldn't want to wrap them up because then they would be a baked potato. And then we would have other problems. So we want to maintain their body temperature. If it's hot outside, we want to cool them off. If it's cool outside, we want to warm them up, maintain their body temperature, and elevate their feet. By simply elevating your feet, you're letting gravity to help push that blood down out of their legs and back up into their head, and that will keep them from having any serious ill effects from shock. The next art item in the, in the medical unit um, paperwork that I shared with you, and for those of you who are watching this online, you can go to the website www.frostcpr.com slash learn. Under there they have a whole section on the medical unit and you can look it up and, uh, and download and print that for yourself. Um, it shows the flow points of the search and rescue and how a medical team should, should um, conduct it and where, they, where you should put people. Not necessarily where, but how to keep them separated. But one of the things you need to know in setting up a triage site is we want to make sure the triage site is in a safe area. For example, should we have had an earthquake, I'm not going to set up a triage in this room. Aftershocks might cause the room to start collapsing. And so I want to get everybody outside. Even if it's inclement weather, maybe under the portico or some other temporary shelter or something, inside might not be a good idea. Let's say you're in an office building and there was some kind of, um, you know, uh, some kind of chemical leak, uh, refrigerant or something else like that in the building. We certainly don't want to have our triage and where we're going to be treating people inside the building if that might be what caused the area. Or if there was a fire. We want to make sure that we are well aware enough away from the people who are doing search and rescue and fighting the fire and everything else that we can be off away so that we can be treating people in a, in a safe manner. Um, we also want to make sure that it is accessible to transportation vehicles. 
It would be really a sad thing to be setting up and we have four or five people who need further assistance and an ambulance comes by, but now we've got to pick them up and move them 300 yards or whatever, to get, or the ambulance couldn't come in. Uh, so we want to make sure that we put it in a place where transportation is easily accessible. Conversely, we also don't want to do it in the middle of a road. And we want to make sure that if there is people coming and going from whatever activities go on that is far enough out of the way that it's not going to be interrupted by car traffic or those kind of things. Because most of the people who are going to be treated are going to be laying on the ground. We don't have gurneys or that kind of thing. They're going to be laying on the ground. And people laying on the ground are not easily seen by cars, especially in an emergency. So all of those things have got to take into account. In the medical treatment area, they need. it says in here we need to talk about verbal communication between the workers in the area. One of the most important things, <coughs> in fact, I was just talking to my son-in-law who's studying to become a doctor. I said one of the most important things that doctors and nurses often forget is talking about their patients in front of their patients or in front of their patients' relatives. So make sure if you're communicating with other people about the status of other people, you're very cautious about who's around you and who hears. It would be a terrible thing to sit there and go, oh yeah, that lady's dead, and the little child is standing there going, how's my mommy? Uh, well, um, let's talk about it, you know. So be careful of how you communicate with the others that you need to, that you need to have communication with, and try to be as, caref as cautious and as sensitive about those people that you're dealing with as well. And the last thing I want to talk about was if you're doing the triage, we have the immediate needs, the delayed needs, and the last one was de dead. Yeah. You obviously are going to have to, or may have to, deal with dead bodies um, and, and, and creating a morgue of some sort. Um, we want to be as respectful as we possibly can to those people. They have families, they have friends, and they will be desirous of trying to find them. And so we want to set up a morgue in such a way that we, if let's say we don't know who these people are, it's, these people are unknown to us, of finding out who they are, writing something on themselves or you know on their hands or whatever who they are, so that if somebody comes looking for somebody, we know who they are and we can and be respectful that way. We also don't want to just pile the people up in a corner. Um, I don't want to go looking for one of my expired relatives piled in the corner like so much dog food. Um, be respectful, lay them out properly, cover them if you can, um, and try to um, try to keep the interaction in that area as minimal as possible. In other words, it would be best if you had just one person in charge of it, and that person was only the person who was going to that area. Um, if it could be cordoned off or something like that, to be as respectful as we could of the dead and of the living who will be who might become looking for the dead. I know in a, in a very short period of time we covered a, a lot of information about emergency um, first aid and first aid kits. Um, I hope that the information that I passed out to you will give you a, a basic primer on the idea. As I, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot more information to be learned on my website on, on, um, on, on all of the subjects covered here. And this little primer that I gave for the medical unit, there is an act, this is actually, I think this is five pages, there's a 15 page um, that spells out this in a lot greater detail um, on the website as well.